Well, hello and welcome again to our online Bible study. We're looking, we're picking up where we left off last time, and we are looking at fear the Lord and what it means to fear the Lord. And the reason that I'm emphasizing that so heavily is because that's what's wrong with our society today, is that there is no fear of the Lord. There are people who are mocking and ridiculing. They're even doing that concerning Billy Graham. He's only been dead a few days, but people are ridiculing and mocking and putting him down. They're ridiculing and mocking our vice president, Mike Pence. They are saying, you know, you have to be crazy to be a Christian and to say that you hear from God. And so they have no, they, they don't fear any consequences of what they're saying. And yet the Lord says that we have to be careful what comes out of our mouths because our mouths are so powerful. What our words, our words are powerful. The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And that's why it's so important for us to not say things that we would later regret because there's no way that you can take those words back. And so there are those that feel, uh, feel like they are very wise in their own eyes. They think that they're a law unto themselves, that they can do whatever they want to, that they can commit crimes and get away with it. I'm talking about those that are in power that they can take advantage of other people, they can kill, they can steal, they can lie, and they can do all these things, and they don't think that there will be consequences to their actions. And yet, that's not true. Their day will come when they will have to face all the consequences of what they have said and done. So there's no fear of God in many instances throughout our culture. And we have, uh, you know, a situation here in our culture that we need to turn things around and have people to have a proper respect for the things of God and who he is. Now this says, turn away from evil. We looked at some other versions that says, depart from evil. So depart or shun evil or turn away from evil are other ways of expressing it. But like Joseph, when he was seduced by Potiphar's wife, he knew that that was not the right thing to do. So he left the scene. He left her with his coat in her hands. Now she accused him falsely and he had had to pay a price, but he would rather do that than sin against God or to sin against his employer, Potiphar. So there are consequences to our actions. So we don't need to be wise in our own eyes, but we're to have respect or fear for the Lord and avoid evil. This is another way of saying it. Instead of shunning or turning away or departing from, you can say avoid evil. In other words, if you know that something is a temptation or something, or there are people that are up to no good, then you don't even go anywhere around them. You go in the other direction. So you want to avoid it altogether. Now, this says respect is earned. Now, here's just one good reason God deserves your respect. None of your bones were hidden from him when he made you inside your mother's body. Who else can say that? God is the one that created us in our mother's womb. So life works best when you respect God and let him be your guide. He will open your eyes. He will guide you away from unwise decisions. You know, I know people don't like to open up an owner's manual. They'd like to figure it out themselves before they 
go through all the instructions that are there in the owner's manual. And I have to say, I have looked at owner's manual and some of them are not very user friendly and are not very clear in their instructions. So they sometimes they're not a very good help anyway. But like I say, the Bible is there and it gives us instructions about all sorts of things. But I received this email just a couple of days ago, and I thought it was so timely because this is what I was, you know, preparing this particular lesson about. And he was quoting from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. This is the New International Version. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Now, this is Pastor Dave Whitehead who has a church there in, in uh, New York City. And he said, we often think that we know more than we really do. And this creates a barrier to learning. And that's true. If you think you know it all, then you just tune out and you just don't listen. And you think you know more than the instructor. But he goes on, but as we become less wise in our own eyes, we open ourselves to knowledge that can change our lives. I don't know about you, but I always want to learn. I am constantly, every day, all throughout the day, Lord, show me, teach me, guide me, instruct me. I want to know more and more. I'm just like a sponge, you know, that I just want more and more and more. Now, this, he says, this posture requires humility, and it does. Again, you have to say that I don't know it all, and I need somebody else who have been down this road before I have or who have studied more or God has revealed things that I'm not aware of. So we have to humble ourselves and say, I'm open I am open to other people and to their knowledge and to their what they have uh, understood and what they've been taught and what they've been trained or what the Lord has shown them. So, it you know, to be a learner, it does require humility. And he said the root of humility is in the fear of the Lord. And it is that we respect the Lord. And we come before him and say, Lord, we know you know it all. You know more than I do. You're greater than all. And that should give us an understanding that should cause us to be less dogmatic about our own thoughts and more gracious to the perspective of others. There are some people that are so dogmatic and they think they're right and it doesn't matter what you say or what you've learned, or what the Lord has shown you, it, they don't care. You're not going to change their mind because they've got their mind set. But it does take humility to open up and say, I'm teachable. I want to learn. Now, changing gears a little bit, let's look at what the Apostle Paul wrote in first, um, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, when he talks about the judgment seat of Christ, he's not talking about everybody. He's talking about believers. For the ungodly, for the unrepentant, for those who have, do not have salvation, they will have to appear before the great white throne judgment of God. The judgment seat of Christ is a place where we are, we go through, I guess you'd say, an examination to determine what we've done with what God has given to us the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the opportunities. It will give Him an opportunity to give us rewards for what we've done, for our work for the Lord, like a bonus or a promotion, if you will. 
But you you know, Jesus gave parables like the parable of the talent. <clears throat> and in that parable, the master gave three different servants talents. To one he gave five, to another two, another one. And then the master went away. And then when he came back later, the servants appeared before him and he said, well, what did you do with the talents I gave you? And the one that had five said, look, I used your five and I made five more. And the other one said, I had two and I, I increased it. I doubled it. But the one that had one said, I was afraid of you. I know what a harsh person you are or uh, how harsh you are, God. And so he said, I hid it. And here it is. And the Lord said to him, you foolish, foolish servant. You knew that I was going to require something from you, and yet you didn't use what I gave you. So there will be that time when we will appear before the Lord, and it will just give us an opportunity to show the Lord what we have done with what he has entrusted to us. He has given us so many gifts, so many opportunities. And so he wants to know what have we done with what we have given him. I know that when I was working at Mastercraft, we had a vice president who was very, um, how would you say it, intimidating and he wanted these monthly meetings with all the managers and he would, uh, we had five, six locations and he would bring the managers together in one place and we would have to present what we were, what we had done in our uh, particular areas of expertise. And, and uh, he didn't want to hear somebody say, well, I'm going to do this, or, well, I'm planning to do this. Oh, that would make him so mad. He didn't want to know what we're going to do. He wanted to know what we had done. He wanted to see results. And the Lord is saying, I've entrusted you with so much. Now I want to see what are the results of what I've given you. It is a time, you know, like I said, it's just like bonus time or promotion time where you're given a, a raise because of your good work. Well, that's what the Lord wants to do for us. He doesn't want to have to condemn us or chastise us. But uh, then Paul goes on in the same chapter, in the next verse, he says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. So knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing that God is all powerful, that God is all knowing, that God is the supreme commander of all of his creations. He says, when we stand before him, he says, I want to, to know that I have persuaded other peoples, that I have tried to motivate them to seek the Lord for themselves. And what we are is known to God, yes. And I hope it's known also to your conscience. God knows us. He knows what we have done and who we are. And he's very concerned with our character and our nature. He's more concerned about that than necessarily our doing. He wants to know our character and our nature. And he wants to know if we're doing acts of kindness and charity to other people. But what about are we telling people about Jesus Christ? Are we sharing the good news of the kingdom of God with other people? Now, this is a little commentary on what Paul was saying here. Some in Corinth were questioning Paul's credential as a minister of the gospel. And they were taking pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. 
So, you know, there are people that would say that Christians who share the gospel may seem out of their minds in the world's eye. And that's what we were saying, that today there are those, just recently at the Oscars, there was a person who began to ridicule and mock our vice president, Mike Pence, because he prays and he hears from the Lord. So there are people in the world who are saying, well, you're crazy, you're out of your mind for doing these things. But we have to know that the good news is God's wise means of salvation. The good news of the kingdom of God is the way that we receive eternal life. We don't want to go down the wrong path. We want to shun evil. So the fear of the Lord should motivate us to share our faith with other people, to know that we have a purpose for being here on this earth, and it is to be a witness. We are to glorify God and to serve him forever, to be a light in the darkness that surrounds us, and to offer hope and life and salvation to those who will receive it. So I think about Billy Graham and all the people that he was able to persuade to give their lives to Jesus Christ. What do you think his reward is when he passed over onto the other side? What do you think happened when he went into the presence of the Lord and all those that were gathered there Don't you think that there was a lot of rejoicing and a lot of welcome home, Billy? Thank you for what you did. I wouldn't be here without you. How many would say that? But Billy would say, well, the reward goes to those who prayed for me, for those who supported me, for those who stood with me and helped me. And that is true. We all have a part to play. Not all of us have the role of an evangelist, but we can give support for those who are called to that particular work. An evangelist can't, he couldn't travel the world unless he had the resources to do so, unless he had uh, a place that he had to have equipment, he had to have television time, all these things that cost a lot of money. So he needed support financially as well as prayer support because to have the prayers, it just meant that the anointing flowed just so much more freely to know that there were voices being lifted up where two or three agree it's touching anything that they shall ask. It shall be done by my Father which is in heaven. No, we don't have to ask, but he asks, he wants us to ask. He wants us to be a part of this. He wants us to receive part of the reward as well. Now this says non-Christians will also be judged for where they stand as sinners before a holy and righteous God. And that is true. We will all have to stand before the Lord whether we're at the judgment seat of Christ or whether we're at the great white throne judgment of God where he judges the ungodly and the unrepentant and those who have not surrendered themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. But think about this from Psalm 14 verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So why would we listen to fools? Why would we listen to someone who's receiving an Oscar, who doesn't believe in God? Why should we value their opinion because they're a fool? This is what the scripture says. For those that do not know God, they're a fool. And we shouldn't 
value what they have to say. They should not influence what we do. They shouldn't intimidate us because they're a fool. They're corrupt. They're vile. They don't do good. It's all about themselves. They're full of selfishness, of greed, of power, of prestige, of acclaim. But I thought it was so funny that they said that the ratings or the viewing of the Oscars was way down. It was like 20, it was somewhere around 26 million people. Out of 300 and less than 325 million people, which is, you know, that's less than 10% of the population who watch the Oscar. Why should we value them? Why should we let them influence our culture? Why should we let those who are atheists, why should we allow them to have positions of power in our nation? Why should we allow them to be the value changers in our society? They're fools. Why should anyone want to listen to them? Why would you want to send your children to universities or colleges where there are atheist professors or teachers? Why would you want your children to be indoctrinated by that, what they have to say? Why would you al allow your young, vulnerable young people to be exposed to their way of thinking when they're fools. Fools to think that there's no God. Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's none who does good. Psalm 53, the fool says in his heart, there is no good. There is no God. Excuse me. They are corrupt, doing an abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. The fool who says there's no God does not do good. Atheist. Why would we want atheist to be the leader in our society? In whatever field that might be, if it's in media or entertainment, in news, in politics, in education, in the arts, in business and finance, in all areas, in the church, even those that don't believe in God and yet they're part of our church, they don't believe in the inherent uh, word of God. They don't believe the scriptures. They believe uh, their own doctrine. Why would we want to listen to them? Atheism, atheism is the belief that there was nothing and nothing happened to nothing and then nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything and then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits, which then turned into dinosaurs. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I tell you, it takes more faith to believe that there is no God than there is for us to believe that there is a God, that there is a creator, that there is a rhyme and reason to thing. To say that there was a big bang, a big explosion, and then all the universe came into existence as a result of that with no creator, with no guiding hand, with no specifications, with no precision. When there's an, an explosion, things just go to pieces. Things are destructive when there's an explosion. But when you have a creator God who knows exactly to the precise measurement how far away that the sun needs to be away from the earth. If it was any further away from us, we would freeze to death. If it was any closer, we would burn to death. He knows how, he, he knows how to put everything in their perfect alignment and orbit so that they don't crash into one another. 
the timing of everything, the precision of everything. And you read in the Bible how precise and how God gave all these measurements and had them doing all this counting. God is so infinite. I mean, he knows right down to the infinite detail of the structure and the precision of the way things need to operate. So again, why why would we listen to fools in our society? Why have we listened to the news media? Why do we listen to some of the politicians who lie to us over and over and over and over again who have no fear of God? For those who have no fear of God, why would we listen to them? The Bible tells us we need to avoid them. We need to shun them. We need to depart from them. We need to turn away from them. We need people who know God, who fear God, and who live by God's word to be in those positions of responsibility in our nation. Because the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that when the righteous rule, people rejoice. When the ungodly rule, the people mourn. I like what Albert Einstein said. He said, insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We can't keep doing the same things over year after year after year and think, think that things are going to get better. We need to change our society, our culture, the dynamics of it. We need to turn away the mindset of our entire nation, or at least the majority of our nation, to get them thinking and being on the same page with one another, on the same page as God and God's wisdom. I was listening to Andrew Womack and Lance Walnow. Andrew Womack has a Bible college, Karis Bible College in Colorado. And also he has Bible colleges scattered throughout the world. He has a huge uh, place there at uh, across from Pikes Peak in Colorado. It's a beautiful location up in the mountains there in Colorado. But it's a Bible school that has uh, what they're doing is teaching and training the students the word of God, but then helping them to apply the principles of the Bible in every aspect of They're not trying to make all preachers or missionaries. We're all missionaries, but our mission field is in different areas. So they're teaching and training people in media, in the arts, in entertainment, in business and finance, in all these other aspects in our society that affects the way that we think and how we operate. So they're teaching and laying the biblical foundation for these students' lives, and then they're training in them in their specific vocation or calling so that they can apply these principles out in the world. The Bible, Jesus said that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. That means it's a teaching ministry, and we need to teach the principles of the Bible because if we want success, if we want prosperity, if we want a nation to thrive, then we need to be founded upon biblical principles and not veer off of that, to avoid evil, to shun it, to turn away from it, to depart from it, and not let it dictate who we are. Listen to Albert Einstein. It's the epitome of a stupidity to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. We need to change our culture. 
That's what God wants us to to do because he has a mission not just for us as individuals, but as a nation as well. Because as America goes, it has an influence and an impact all across the world. We need good entertainment. We need good news media that gives us the true news. We need good businessmen and financial men, and we need good people, men and women, in politics and government and law. We need good judges. And Lance Wallnow is also a business and, and governmental consultant, and he met with President Trump before even Trump was elected. And he teaches these same principles that there are seven mountains of influence in our culture, including the church or religion, the family, business and finance, education, politics, government, law, um, in the arts and entertainment, in sports, all these things. All of these things, all of these different areas or aspects of our culture shape our nation. And we need to make sure that we have men and women in every one of what he calls these seven mountains of influence in our culture. So we need to be the salt and light. And we need to have a proper respect of Almighty God. This is Isaiah chapter 8 verse 13. Do not fear anything except the Lord Almighty. Highlight that phrase right there, that sentence. Do not fear anything except the Lord Almighty. Don't fear those who have wealth and power. Don't be intimidated by what they say and how they ridicule us and try to intimidate us and try to mock and ridicule us, and and they cast aspersions on our mentality and all these things, why should we listen to them? They're fools. Don't fear anything except the Lord Almighty. Why do you fear anybody except the Lord? He is the one that we're going to have to stand before. He's the one that we're going to have to answer to when it's all said and done. He alone is the Holy One. If you fear Him, you don't need to fear anything else. Just fear Him. That's all we have to do. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and He shall be your fear, and He shall be your dread. Then He shall become a sanctuary. Or to put it another way, Make the Lord, capital, when you see Lord in all capital letters, that means Yudhe that means Yahweh, the name that the Jews will not even speak. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. When it says heaven's armies, it's talking about the angels. It's talking about Michael and Gabriel and all the hosts of heaven who are there at our command, who are ministering spirits for us, sent to the heirs of salvation. So make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear, not anybody else. He's the one you should make, who should make you tremble. He will keep you safe. He's the one that will keep you safe. If you want safety, if you want security, then fear God. Fear and trust Him. He is the one that we are to respect and honor. Isaiah 11.3 And He will delight in the fear of the Lord. And He will not judge by what His eyes see, nor make a decision by what His ears hear. Think about this. What did Jesus do in Luke chapter 6, verse 8? But He knew what they were thinking. 
Jesus knew. He perceived what people were thinking about him. You couldn't fool Jesus. Luke eleven seventeen. But he knew their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. They didn't have to say it. Jesus knew. He knows us. And he is the one that we will either rely and depend on and put our trust in, or he's the one that's going to say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Look at these verses in another version, verses 3 through 5 of Isaiah 11. He will take delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by mere appearances or make decisions on the basis of hearsay. He will treat the poor fairly and make right decisions for the downtrodden of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and order the wicked to be executed. Justice will be like a belt around his waist. Integrity will be like a belt around his hips. Now think about this. We talked about the kingdom of God. This all is tying together here. What is the kingdom of God like? And the fact that Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's will. He wants this earth to operate just like it is in heaven, where there will be peace and unity and harmony where there will be justice, where there will be kindness and goodness, where there will be faithfulness and integrity, where there will be excellence, where there will be character. That's what he wants to happen here on this earth. Unfortunately, God, Jesus, will have to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and ordered the wicked to be executed because of the stubbornness of their hearts, because they're fools, because they don't believe in God and they don't fear God. They're fools. And unfortunately, they will be executed in the end if they do not repent. But it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's willing to forgive if You know, it says that in the scriptures. It says that we are to call upon him while he is near. Seek him. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous, his thoughts, his words. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. This is what the word tells us. This is what God wants. Turn from your wickedness. But unfortunately, there are those who will not humble themselves before God and will not accept who he is or what he wants for our lives. They do not want to be a part of the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, they will not be part of the the kingdom of God. It's not that we're to ridicule or call them names or put them down like they do us. We Jesus said that we're to pray for those that despitefully use us, that we're to love our enemies. And that means that we should pray that these people do become saved, that they do turn around and that they do give their lives to the Lord. If they have so much influence and power now, What if they were saved? What kind of impact could they have on the world if they would just turn their lives around and give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ? They could make a world of difference in the the situation in our country and as well as the countries and nations of the world. So this is very, very, very important this message, and we're going to continue this in our next lesson because we need to change our mindset in our country and in our culture. And it's got to start 
at the house of the Lord. We've got to fear God and not man and not be intimidated. Not, you know, when they say, don't speak in the name of Jesus, we have to be like Peter and John. We can't help it. All we're doing is telling you what we've seen and heard. We're witnesses. So we need to be bold and courageous and lift up the name of Jesus and share the good news of the kingdom of God with whosoever will receive it. That's our job. That's our mission. So fear the Lord. Shun evil. Depart from evil. Turn away from evil. Avoid it. Get out of Dodge. Serve the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Love Him with everything within your being. Give Him your whole life. Let Him be the Lord of your life. And you will, and great will be your reward when you meet Him on the other side. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.